All right, welcome everyone. We've got another special podcast, number 99, Josh Luber, CEO, one of the co-founders of StockX, among many other things. Josh, how's it going? Uh, unbelievable. Thank you for having me. And I got to say, I just want to start. I'm so disappointed he couldn't wait and make me number 100. So I, you know, it, you know, I, I honestly, I think it would have hurt Koontz too much. It was like one of those <laughs> things where I think he just wouldn't be able to take it. So that's fair. Want- I didn't want him, um, you know, to get to, to cry, but yes, thank you very much for being on. This is, this is a big one, 99, we're almost to a hundred. And, and this is, uh, we've had the pleasure of meeting, uh, during quarantine and, and, you know, we have some similar interests in sports cards and, uh, as well as poker, you know, dabble a bit as well. So uh, we'll definitely cover that, but I want to kind of start with your background just for those that, again, this is a poker centric podcast, but we dive out of, uh, to other genres. Um, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and, and sort of the uh, the story of Josh Luber. Give me the cliff notes up until, let's say, StockX, and then I want to ask uh, some more story. Um, I love your story about that as well, so I got to have you kind of retell that. Um, and before we get into all that, what's going on in the background? This is ridiculous. This is the best background guest uh, background I've seen. So what, what's happening there? This is the, actually the, this is the... Uh... Uh, this is the public view. The better view is definitely is, is this this version. I'm gonna pick up my camera here. So this is my uh, my sneaker oh, room yeah. here in uh, in Detroit, uh, in my house. Wow. So um, yeah, the back is just uh, a handful of boxes that I end up stacking up to uh, um, just some extra boxes and stuff like that. Wow. So yeah, I mean this wow. is what you know. This this is the problem of of you know collecting sneakers. It's just functionally where you're gonna store them all. When we were looking for houses, when we moved to Detroit, my wife had about a hundred things that she wanted in a house, like normal people have, you know, garage or or bedrooms or, you know, yard. I had one thing. I was like, I need a room like this. I need to be able to build a room for all my sneakers and found this, this perfect room for it. So um, yeah, it's my sneaker room slash office. So, so, I mean, that's not a design closet. This is a bedroom or room turned closet. It's uh, it's above my garage. So it's a two car garage. That's the size of the room. And it already had drywall and carpet and it's mm. part of the house. So it was just like extra room that uh, there was. And I was like, oh, that's just like a perfect place to to build out a, a sneaker closet. So, um, yeah. yeah. Your, your wife must have some pull on her closet, though. With you get to go crazy with shoes and cars. I'm sure she's got she gets to I, I'd love that her closet must be pretty elaborate. I would imagine she gets to uh, have some nice bells and whistles. Well, it's yeah. funny, you know, I mean, getting into like the history of this and, and me was that you know, sneakers is, or, or was up until very recently, you know, my, my job, my career in, in starting StockX. So, um, you know, there was a period of time where I was just collecting sneakers as a collector and any normal person, spouse, whomever would say, Hey, you know, at what point is, is enough enough? At what point is too many? Um, and then once you turn it into your job, it's like, Hey, look, you know, this is my job and part of it. So if there's anyone that uh, can, can rationalize having 400 pairs of shoes in a closet like this. Um, You know, it's gotta be me. Somehow I couldn't convince my accountant that this was tax deductible. Um, We're still working on that one, but. Well, just show them the podcast. This is your office for doing, doing, uh, you know, interviews and such and and Uh podcasting. So I think that that could fly, but it does look cool. And then the fact that that's actually, you had the the sicker view on the, just to the side, that's even a, it's kind of a slow roll, but um, very cool. So yeah, give us a, again, so much to cover. I actually have something that was like, it got me so excited today, which I'll talk about later that we share in common. I actually couldn't believe it, that this was somehow in an article. I was going to say it right now, because I just can't take it. I wanted to tell you that the bubblicious thing, the, dude, I'd say you can't, that's what I tell people all the time. My first job was the bubblicious and you even broke it down. I remember exactly my mom would, we'd go out to the store She'd buy them and it was five packs. You and I would sell them a dollar a pack, and I think it was four dollars. Or you could bring uh-huh. five pieces in a pack, a quarter. And I had them in my. I think I was fourth or fifth grade. I had the same teacher. I remember it was there. And I think you were sixth grade. It mentioned, and that uh-huh. was my hustle. That was where I like. That's where it all started for me. And I, I actually like hopped out of my chair. I told my mom and dad, I was like, "There's no way. I've never heard anybody." The fact that you said bubblicious as well. That's just like impossible because like that's so random. I mean, not bazooka, not any other gum. That's the gum in the packs, and that's what I did in the exact same time. It's it freaked me out. So I, I don't know. That is that's crazy because I didn't know what you were gonna say. You said you know there was some crazy coincidence. No one's ever brought that up. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if anyone's even found that. You know, I have, I've, uh, I've mentioned a few times, but for sure that was, it was, I was right on the same time as, as, as baseball cards to me, right? Like, there's so many entrepreneurs, my generation, our generation, 
who got their start in either baseball cards or candy. Or in fact, um, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, right? Yeah, of course. So the first time that I ever met Gary was about uh, five years ago or so. And uh, it was it was in New York and it was this one of these tiny little like very typical New York lunch counter spots. I mean, super like narrow like this. I got there before him and he sat down next to me and we were at a, uh, you know, at the counter. And we're like this close, right? I mean, he's like this, he slides down. And the first thing he said to me, we've never met at this point, right? He goes, he sits down, he goes, you're about my age, baseball cards are candy. That's all he said. And I was like, I was like, oh, I was like, actually both, you know, and like, and that was it for our generation. Like those were the two hustles when you were 12 in 1988 to, um, to go and, and do that. And for me, that, um, that was the first candy run was sixth grade. And I had another one in ninth grade. But I lived right uh, behind a Acme grocery store and I could climb the fence in my backyard and hop over and go to the store. And it was and it was probably the same year we're talking about here that Bubblicious was selling four packs for a dollar and I could sell them for a quarter apiece. But the key to this and what, what put me out of business was there were three different or four different flavors in that four pack. Yep. And one of them was orange and nobody would buy orange. Mm. And so I started to build up this inventory of orange, but it was still worth it to buy, get the other three packs because of whatever the math was. So all of a sudden I was building up all this inventory of orange. And then, um, you know, one day the, the kind of like school bully wanted me to give him a free piece of gum. And I was like, no, nobody gets free gum, you know? Right. And uh, he followed me to my locker and stole my bag of gum and ran down the hall. And we got stopped for like running in the hall. And then the social studies teacher opened up the bag and there were 131 packs of gum, almost all orange. And, uh, and he confiscated it and, you know, and that, and that kind of uh, ended that business. But that was like, for sure. My first like my business. Yeah. Well, and are you, you're 42. Is that right? 42. Or, uh, it's interesting though. Cause I think it said sixth grade and I, I, I was in, I'm 34 and it was in my fourth or fifth grade. So maybe it was the same, but I, I oh, like, will never forget. I'm sure that was the price. Like I yeah. remember exactly. Cause I remember the math and, and how it worked out. Uh -huh. um, that so yeah maybe it was you know Bubblish just had a good run I haven't seen it in a long time I don't know if it's out of business or what but that was uh I do remember that brand I hadn't heard that that's word amazing in years so that that uh but yeah very cool so yeah I mean we're very I think we have a lot of similar interests that's safe to say tell us a little bit about your yeah. your journey your where you grew up and you know so we, we covered your first business Bubblicious, but then from there like did you grew up yeah. like, from born and raised Philadelphia or is that where yeah you well what's yeah your, yeah your I grew up in Philly and, and you know I I think that, you know, back then the word entrepreneur didn't exist. We didn't realize, um, you know, there was no internet there, you know, there were no apps that, you know, um, so obviously it was a, a different environment, but that was definitely my first business. And I collected cards, you know, all through middle school. And, and that was, you know, such an important part of my life at that point of understanding business of trading baseball cards with, with friends and trying to understand the value of things. Um, and, um, but like a lot of people, when, the, when cards crashed in, uh, in the early nineties. Um, and I went on to high school and, and cards weren't, weren't as cool and, and kind of left that behind. And I'm sure we'll, we'll circle back around on cards, um, on this whole thing. But, um, but you know, the other thing that was my biggest passion at the time was sneakers. Like the two, the two things were my most important, you know, passions or, or as a 10, 12 year old kid were sneakers and, and baseball cards. And, and that was it. And, um, and so from a business standpoint, uh, I went, I went down to Atlanta for college. I was in Atlanta for about 15 years, I went to Emory college, uh, grad school. I was a JD MBA, um, started a couple startups in between the two. Um, and I actually, um, when I graduated as JD MBA, I actually went and worked as a lawyer at a big firm for a little while. Um, but the entire time I was there, I was working on a startup on the side. So as soon as that startup was ready, I quit. Um, so I was like 11 months into my job, I think I was like the first one for my law school class to, to leave like the big firm life. But I knew the whole time I, I was working on startups on the side. Right. And, um, and, you know, when I look back there in between every startup, there was always some corporate gig. Because I've started four, well, three startups before StockX, but the first one when I was single, the second when I was married with no kids, the third when I was married with one kid, and the fourth when I was married with two kids. So every one of them has a different, you know, risk profile and and what you need in order to pay the bills, et cetera. Um, so, but but the quick version is is that um, you know I I had a couple of corporate jobs, including working as an attorney, um, and then also working at IBM as a strategy consultant. And it was at IBM that I created uh, the business on the side. It was called Campless, 
that would become StockX. And Campos was a, a price guide for sneakers. It was kind of like the Beckett for sneakers. And that business started around 2012 for me. Um, and that's why I was at IBM and, and doing this aside. Eventually, I was able to leave IBM and I turn it into StockX. Campos.com actually does just pour into StockX right now. I looked at it. So that, yeah. was, that was literally, that was your comp That was what it was. And now it is, that is merged or bought and, and acquired and changed. Um, so that, that was 2012. And how long were you working on that before it, it got kind of, uh, uh, yeah, well, so it was 2012 through 2015. Um, and that was all on the side. What was really extraordinary about that was, you know, we were just the only people doing real analytics around the resale sneaker market in a time where there, there just wasn't people would, would go to eBay, they'd use eBay sales auctions, closed auctions, but there wasn't a, a place to really understand the value of sneakers. And that's all we were trying to do in the beginning. I was at IBM. I was, you know, inundated with data work as any other consultant would be. And the idea really is just spun out of, hey, I wonder if I could get a hold of some sneaker data. I wonder what I could do with it because I've collected sneakers all my life. And here I am at IBM doing all this data work. Mm -hmm. um, and that led down that path. But what happened was once we put some of that out into the world, once we started telling people that we were doing this sneaker data business, for that really small overlap of people who like sneakers and like data, this hit them over the head like a hammer. So people started coming out of the woodwork saying, hey, I love sneakers. I love data. Can I help? Can I get involved? And, um, and I was like, sure, you know, I'm doing this on the side, you know, nights and weekends. And so we actually ended up building this, this volunteer army. And by the time I would sell Campus uh, in 2015, you know, we can talk about that in a second. But by the time I got there, there were 17 people that worked for Campus in some form. There was no contracts, there was no money, there was no equity, there was no business. Like it was just this data content um, thing that we all thought was cool. And when I did sell the company, everybody was taken care of, but everybody was doing it just because they liked it. And by the way, I screened hundreds of people probably to get to those 17. Um, and it, some of them I still have never met to this day. That guy who did all the graphic design, I'd only ever met by e email, never spoke to him on the phone, never met him in person. Uh, you know, he was a friend of a friend and I mean, really interesting stuff, but some of those guys have come along with me. Some of them still work at StockX. One of them uh, was our first CTO at StockX is now my CTO at the next company. Um, and I kind of look at, you know, if you want to look back through the lens, I kind of feel like my career has been a process in collecting co-founders of, of identifying people that I work well together that you can create other business with. And, and just because Maybe that next business isn't right, but you know that the one after that might be the one to to reconnect with with people. Um, because if you're an entrepreneur, like you're always looking for for what that business is and and or or, or what the things are you can create. And and you know I, I know you think pretty similar in the in the same way in terms of you know your interactions of of taking just beyond poker, but the things you've done it. And it's around those people that you meet and to create those opportunities to do things with. So that's very much how it's been for me. Yeah, I like that expression. I'd never heard that before. You said that to me in person, and I, it, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's talk about that because this thing called StockX now StockX, which is um, no, uh, it, it, it you know I, you probably have heard of it out there. You may or may not, but there's a, there's a look at the um, the Instagram page and then the the website. But uh, tell me a little bit about you know this has become a, a it's a billion dollar business. But how did it start, and how did that kind of campless uh, whole story with uh, Dan Gilbert as well? Probably many people are familiar with Dan from Quicken Loans and yeah. uh, now StockX, and also owning the Cleveland Cavaliers. But sort of give me a little bit of a, a, an idea of how how that started. Actually, and before we go to that, um, campless. You came up with the idea. Mm -hmm. I get to play. You mentioned it sort of meant camp less, like camp less often than in stores. People actually camp outside for sneakers. That was sort of the 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 play on words on that is that very, right? very 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 witty. I was very proud of myself coming up with such a witty. Here's the thing: at the time, and even even today, every blog, every company in the sneaker industry is sneaker news kicks on fire, nice kick, soul collector. Like it's all just you know something with a, a sneaker or soul or kick. So I was like, look, we're gonna come up with a name that does not have sneaker, soul, kick, flip, like any of it in there, and we either build a brand around it or not. And uh, and so yeah, so. Campus was what was the uh, was the name, um, so. So, but that so that name comes at you. Ha you get the name, you do it like you said. I wasn't even set up necessarily like a business, and and all how it was structured. It got very popular. The data, like where were you when you were at IBM? 
And did this happen? Like, a, did you, were you just sitting there? You're like, I love sneakers. You had this idea that the data could be very interesting. You're like, I'm doing this for a business or did it sort of come gradually? Or did you have like an aha moment where you were sitting at your desk? Like, I got to do this. Like, how did that? Yeah. I mean, the reality is, and I, I think most entrepreneurs would agree with this. There's very few true aha moments, right? I mean, most of, of, of these things are very um, iterative. Um, that you have one idea that leads to another that leads to another and, and they may be variations on the same thing. But um, in February of 2012, um, we had a really, uh, there was a confluence of a lot of events that led to, you could think of it as kind of the uh, like big bang uh, of, of sneaker culture uh, to make it to where it is today, to make it being such a mainstream thing. You had um, Instagram was going through its own hockey stick growth right after Facebook had bought Instagram uh, uh, just a few months before that. Um, and the sneaker companies were all starting to figure out how to leverage social media to market, but also to release products. Nike had been releasing some products via Twitter. And then All-Star Weekend of February 2012 um, was in Orlando. And there was a, a Galaxy you know, space theme. And there were a couple of shoes that were released that weekend, the, the Nike pack that had released that weekend, including one particular shoe called the Nike Foam Posit. And, um, and it felt like the whole sneaker world exploded. And it felt like everybody was coming out of the woodwork. Everyone wanted the, these particular shoes. Um, and there were riots. And, and we, we had stories like we did in the 90s around violence and sneakers and sensationalizing that part of it. Um, one person famously had a Craigslist post offering to trade his car for a pair of these shoes. I mean, it was, um, and that was the first moment for me as a sneaker collector on sort of outside looking in saying, Hey, I wonder if there's a business opportunity in sneakers because I've always intentionally avoided trying to create any business in sneakers, almost out of fear of, of creating a business that was just an excuse to play with sneakers, right? Like when I grew up, the idea of, of chasing your passion, like, that didn't exist. You know, the word entrepreneur didn't exist. The internet didn't exist. It was like, you go to school, you might go to grad school, you go get a job and, you know, but like that, that, so I almost intentionally separated trying to, to work in sneakers. And it was that because it was a side project, because I was at IBM and because the whole sneaker world was, was exploding that I was like, man, I wonder what the angle is. And I happened to be at IBM deep in data work. So that was my point of view at that time. And that kind of just led down the path. And so originally, um, there were a couple other uh, business ideas of what I thought you could create with it. There was kind of like a subscription model business that I thought for a second. Um, and I iterated through a couple things before <clears throat> we were building the, the price guide. We were always building the price guide, but iterating through what you could do with it. You know, does it become uh, a content site and you, you know, you're, you're competing with the blogs? You know, does it come... Uh, does it is it just a pure data business where you sell data? Um, and it was probably over a course of about nine months, um, iterating through the different businesses, doing the data work, um, you know, deep in the sneaker industry um, from a business standpoint. And actually, it's probably closer to about like 12, 15 months that the idea finally sort of emerged that I thought would work, which is or, or that that I really like wanted to pursue hard, which was this idea that um uh, what would become StockX, but this idea of a, of a stock market-like environment. Because the idea was, if you understand the value of one pair of sneakers, that's what Campus was. Campus was a price guide. It told you the value of sneakers. It's like if you Beck, under Beckett for yeah, cards, exactly. exactly. Beckett, Kelly Blue Book, et cetera. Like, that was like the one specific piece of value that we created, right? If you knew that, then you could very easily look at someone's entire sneaker collection and value it. And then you could look at that the same way you look at a stock portfolio and track their value over time, which was frankly a pretty obvious application of value of, of understanding that. But then the logic was, and this is you know, I'm sort of like talking through how this iterated over months, but the logic was if you understand asset pricing and you understand portfolio construction, then perhaps you can actually create a stock market for sneakers. Just a very like linear progression and thought around the data itself. But of course, you know, I am not a, an engineer. Um, I couldn't build a stock market for sneakers myself, but it was just kind of what I thought made sense with the data. Mm -hmm. And so I got to the point where I had this, this kind of like one page roadmap that basically had those three things on it. 
And I started, you know, leveraging campus and, and the, um, the notoriety that we were getting to have meetings with everybody in the sneaker industry. And I took this one piece of paper to, to all of them, Nike, eBay, Foot Locker, Complex, Flight Club, like you name it. And, um, and I went in there with this idea. I'm like, hey, here's the, this is how it works and what I think you can do. And every one of them uh, was, was polite about it, but they were all like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. But what we want to do is we want to take your data and do X, Y, and Z in our business. And fair enough, right? I didn't think Nike was going to change your whole business and build a stock market. That's how, that's how I would look at them if, if I was them. And so, um, you know, you kind of fast forward a little bit. And now I'm uh, basically in the like, beginning of 2015. So really all of 2014 is pushing this thing really hard, taking these meetings. And then in early 2015, I'm to the point where I've met with just about everyone in the space. It doesn't feel like there's any fit uh, of who to work with, what to do. And, uh, and then my wife um, was pregnant with our second kid. And I knew that, you know, I mean, for the whole first kid, I was, I don't say I was MIA, but like I, I got a pass because I was at two full-time jobs between IBM and Campless. And uh, and so I got all the best part of, of, of fatherhood and, and none of the really tough part in the beginning. Right. But I knew that like it, it just wasn't going to fly having having two kids uh, and figuring out. Um, and so in the back of my mind, there was a little bit of a like an end to this. It was like, all right, well, something's got to give. And um, and it was right before Easter of 2015. Right. So April of, of 2015. And um uh, and it's like, um, it's like the Wednesday before Easter and I get a random, uh, email from, uh, from two guys that say, Hey, you know, we work with Dan Gilbert, as you mentioned, Dan, the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers and Quicken Loans, but it's got no ties to sneakers whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And they say, Hey, listen, we work with Dan. We've seen what you're doing in camp We like to talk. We get on the call and it's like word for word, the exact same conversation I had a thousand times. I didn't think anything of it really. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they call me back two days later. It's the Friday before Easter. And they send me an email and they say, listen, we definitely want to do this business with you. We definitely want to you know, work with you. And we'd like to fly you to Cleveland to go to a game and meet Dan. Well, the first half, I'd say, it's like, well, whatever. Everybody says they're going to do shit, right? The second half, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. You can take me to a, to a game. Like, no problem. You know, I'm a huge basketball fan. So this is what I think the whole story is going to be. I'm like, all, like, I get to go to a game and meet, you know, an owner, like, awesome. And I'm in Philly, so they fly me to Cleveland. Well, well, first they're like, "Hey, you know, it's it's super short notice. Can you come on on Easter Sunday?" And I'm like, "I'm Jewish, absolutely. Like, let's make this thing happen, you know." And so the one caveat was my wife at this time was was nine months, uh, right? yeah, was nine months pregnant, you know, and you know it was was I don't know what what she was thirty uh, thirty four weeks. I mean, some some crazy number. And the um and so the plan was. And I don't know if this would have, again, fought, if it was the first kid, but it was the second kid. So the plan was fly in in the morning, go to the game, and then come right back home to Philadelphia. Right. So we get there, we kind of make small talk during the game. And after the game, we go in this private uh, room, and it's Dan, and it's two guys and me. And then we go all the background, me and sneakers and IBM and campus. And um, and then I, I, I show them this this page. And I, you know, I, I take out my, my one page that's got these three things on it, and I, and I walk through uh, this, this idea of, of a stock market of things and, you know, uh, campus price guide, et cetera. And these guys look at me with pure shock and it doesn't register to me why. And then one of them takes out a piece of paper and he's like, yeah, we have one of those. That is exactly what we want to build a stock market for sneakers. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, so like the crazy backstory of this company is that there was maybe one other person in the whole world that had the exact same idea at the exact same time. And it happens to be one of the most successful business people in the world, right? Like, what the like? It's so crazy for so many reasons, right? Because first of all, Dan's got no ties to sneakers, right? How how excited? Be honest. Like when you go there, though, at this point, you fly there. Like, did you think something was going to come of this? At this point, they're serious. They're coming to the game, and were you even able to enjoy the game? Yeah, you're courtside. You're at the owner of the Cavaliers. It's pretty cool. Uh, you know, a whole situation. And, and was it like, were you able able to enjoy the game? Were you just like rehearsing like how it was going to go after what you're going to show them, or, or were you able to get get into the moment? It's funny because I got this. So you know, I didn't realize at the time, I mean, I did, but I didn't, that, um, you know, those guys are live in Detroit and we were going to Cleveland. So they were actually coming down to the game. So I got there before them and I, I made my way to the suite and Dan, uh, actually his seats and he watches the game on the floor. And so someone found me and I said, Hey, you know, are, are you Josh Luber? I said, yeah, listen, you know, Dan's running late. He asked, 
me to take you down to the seats. So this is like pregame, there's warm up. So they walk me down to the, the seats and I don't know where we're going to. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we were walking down and down and then we're on the court and then we're like walking right by the bench. And then they, they seat me literally like, like it's, it's the corner, right? So the Cavs bench is here and Dan seats are here and they seat me right here in like seat one. And like LeBron is sitting right here, like, you know, like tying his shoes. And I'm like, well, if this is intentional, this is pretty badass. But like, go put Josh right next to LeBron, you know, and just sit there. And it wasn't intentional, right? It's just, and you know, he's like a walking statue. So like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm this close to LeBron, and I'm like, what's going on, you know? Um, and you know, it was a, it was, it was a surreal experience, the whole thing, because I had no idea how it was going to play out. I and you know, during the game, Dan was super cordial, but like, we didn't discuss any business. Yeah. Um, and I was like, when are we going to talk about, you know, sneakers? When are we going to talk about campus? Um, and then, you know, we go back and, and are having this conversation and we get to the point that we realize we're both like essentially having the same idea. And, uh, and in the back of my mind, you know, I'm like, well, I got to get to a plane soon. Like what, you know, and, uh, and Dan's like, we, we got to get you out to Detroit. You got to come see everyone and meet everyone. And this is Sunday. Right. So I was like, well, my week's pretty light this week at IBM. I'm sure I could come whenever. So Dan's assistant takes out his phone and he's like, ah, he's like, Dan has some time on like Tuesday or Wednesday. Dan's like, put that away. Why don't you come back with us right now? And I was like, uh, okay. Uh, so I text IBM. I'm like, not showing up at work tomorrow. Sorry. Text my wife. I'm like, please don't go into labor. You know, I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I gotta, I gotta go. Um, and so, um, we go to Detroit, spent all day in Detroit on Monday, meeting everyone, touring the city. Monday afternoon, uh, Monday evening, back in Dan's office, and he's like, "Listen, we would really like you to stay another day to keep talking." And I was like, I, "I was like, yeah, sure, like of course, you know." Text IBM, not showing up. Text my wife, like, please don't kill me, right? Um, finally, end of the day, Tuesday, back in Dan's office, he's like, "Listen, we all think this is the right fit. We want to buy campus. We'd like you to come here and, and run the company." And um, they finally let me go home. I, I get home at like 1 a.m. on Tuesday night. My wife's waiting up for me. Fortunately, she hasn't given birth. And, you know, I walk in the door and I'm like, I was like, I think we're moving to Detroit. And she goes, what the hell? I thought you went to Cleveland. She didn't so, say, yeah, you did. And so you basically you go for like, you're supposed to come out at night, go days later, go to Detroit. Things are moving pretty quickly. And at this point, you know, it was real, right? I mean, there's like, basically negotiating a deal and how it's yeah. going to move forward, but it was happening. Um, yeah. And, and so uh, shortly, and then shortly thereafter, you know, they sent me an offer via email and we negotiated back and forth via email for a little while. And uh, in that was April. In June, I went back out to Detroit to, to shake hands with Dan and, and, um, and close the deal. And from there, we started working on StockX. And, and the, the name, I think I asked you, and it is funny because I can relate with some of the stuff I've done where I don't really remember. And I, even though like, I'm sure it was me or you know, it, was a, it was a different things, but the name is ridiculously cool. I love the name. I love the look. I love the feel of the whole thing. Um, how did that come about? And was it like for, for a name? Cause it's, I mean, it just seems so obvious. It's such a great name. It's like, what else could it be? But what were any other names at all? Was there like a, did it come down to like you guys voted on two or three? Like, is it, could it have been something else and who ultimately named stock X or do you even know? Yeah. Well, so when I got there, they were calling the thing soul trade S O L E T R E D kind of like after marriage trade, but you know, soul and you know, Back to my campus story, I was like, look, I was like, I'm not saying that like it can't be something like trade. I was like, but we can't have soul kick sneakers. It can't be that. Mm-hmm. And everybody was fine, was was okay with that theoretically, but we couldn't come up with with another name. And so, you know, how do we come up with a name? Like elbow grease. I mean, hours and hours in like in a room with whiteboard and going through it in multiple sessions. And um, and nobody actually can remember who came up with it. I know that I came up with stock market X. Like I remember specifically like saying that and writing it down and somebody shortened it to stock X and there were, I think there were nine of us at the time. And then Dan, but like when we were doing, I was, I was the fifth person. There were four people, then me, we hired a couple of people. So at the time we're, cause we were working on the thing for the whole time, time, but we were, we launched in February of 2016. So obviously we needed to have a name locked down by then. And, um, and there's a picture of a whiteboard that someone found and it's got everyone's voting for like what their top names are. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and me, my brother and like, and two other people had like stock X is number one. And then all the rest were like kind of scattered. And so it's like, you go back and look at it and 
you know, it's, it's, I have no idea, but here's the thing. There, there was one, there was one name that we all really liked that we were considering. And in retrospect, it's horrible, but it was matter, M-A-T-T-E-R, matter.com. Okay. Go to matter.com. We'll see and see, see what happens. Okay. It redirects to a, a Mark Cuban website, right? Okay. So and at the time, it wasn't even this profession. It was like Mark Cuban T-shirts, and um, and Dan is you know NBA owner. Mark's an NBA owner, so we went to Dan and said, "Look, we want to name the company Matter.com, but you know Cuban owns a domain here. Can you hit him up?" And so Dan sends kind of a nondescript email that says, "You know, hey, you know, I've I've know some guys that they're interested in domain Matter.com, and uh, you know, any any chance that you can you'd sell it to me?" And uh, and Cuban writes back like. And all it said was Twitter offered a million. I said no, and that was it. And and you know us being like we're like well should we like we talk to him like what should we and Dan's like fuck that guy. He's like let's you know he's like let's move on. He's like I'm not having that guy involved in this stuff. He's like he can't even discuss a domain name and and the whole thing. And like the reality is is like if that had gone a different way, the company might be called Matter.com and Cuban could be a you know a co-founder with us. Who knows? Um, But. uh, Safe to say those are two of the more, those guys, Dan Gilbert and, and Mark Cuban are two of the more, you know, the younger, hipper business guys, kind of, you know, fun, doing a lot of different investments. I'm sure some of the other NBA owners also are, have done a lot of, you know, business savvy things, but those guys are sort of the two that stand out to me, at least my generation culture, sort of guys that like, you know, really did it and came up and, and do some, a lot of different uh, business type things. So uh, yep. very, yeah, those are two, two strong names. A pretty crazy, pretty crazy story. Glad it worked out with StockX and, uh-huh. and, uh, and for you to, you know, move from Philadelphia to Detroit. That was actually one of my major questions. I want to know you've lived in Atlanta, lived in Philadelphia, lived in Detroit. Um, what, what do you, which city do you like the most and why in terms of for living, which are, are you, you know, kind of hard maybe to say different. So yeah. different, but. Well, you know, I, I also, I lived in New York for a couple of years and I lived in Barcelona for a year as well. Um, you know, I love where I live in Detroit right now. Uh, and for me right now with two kids and, you know, it, it's, it's really great. Um, but I definitely thought I was going to live in Atlanta my whole life. Um, I had no intention of ever leaving Atlanta. The only reason I left was because I needed a job and, and I ended up taking a job for IBM that required me to move to New York city. Um, and so, you know, I really don't have a, a favorite. Not. I love, you know, I really like, I, I love all those places I live, but, um, you know, my wife knew, and I always knew that, um, you know, like location wasn't going to be a, a, a bottleneck in, in this and, and who knows? I mean, obviously now in a COVID world, um, there's a whole lot less need to be anywhere, but you know, if the right move was to, to go to California, um, you know, we might do that. In fact, for, we, we were really close to, um, uh, moving to Hong Kong for a minute. Um, when I was still working at, at the law firm in Austin and Bird. And, um, and I ended up leaving the law firm and going in and doing a startup. And that was why we didn't do that. But um, I, you know, I, I just think that it's such a different life when you get to experience and actually live in a city. So, but I mean, you've lived in a lot of places too, right? Yeah. I mean, I've had a, I've had, a, you know, a fair share of, uh, of places that it is just kind of all unique and different and different times for different things make, make a lot of sense. Uh, what about sports teams wise though? Are you, are you a veteran? All Philly, all Philly, all, Philly. all, okay. all Philly all the time. You grew up in Philadelphia. That's it. By the way, for four years, the amount of shit I would get every time someone would catch me on the floor at a Cavs game of, uh, you know, from Philly fans. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, all, all Philly. I think that's excusable. Yeah. yeah my, uh, my, actually, I have a lot of Philly ties. I went to Christmas there, I think for like 15 years in a row. And a lot of my family's based there. My dad grew up, went to lower Marion as well in, in Philadelphia. And, and obviously did we not talk about this. Cause I, I, I went to Harrington, which is right down the street from lower Marion. Yeah. I think we, 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 we I think we did. Yeah. My dad yeah. was there when Joe Jellybean Bryant was, and then Kobe Bryant went there. And I mean, Phil, Philly's a yep. great city. I have, a, I have a lot of love for Philadelphia and I've been there so many times. It's uh you know, South street and, all the stuff there. It's got a great, very, very uh, passionate fans as well in sports, yep. diehard. Yeah. So it's uh, it's yeah. good to see the Eagles get a championship, and you know they've had uh, some good, good runs and stuff. But um, so okay, so stock. Well, hold on, Be- before you so so you mentioned Joe and Kobe. So Kobe was a year behind me in school, and so what happened was because Lower Marion and Harrington, the two high schools are basically down the street from each other and kind of all in the same social circle, same neighborhood. I actually lived closer to Lower Marion than Harrington. But what happened was because of Kobe. 
all the really great basketball players in our neighborhood were all recruited to go play with him. And so they won multiple state championships. And it left me as a starting point guard on our high school team. And, you know, we won two games in three years. So, uh, you know, that's what happens when, uh, you know, all, all, all the good players get to go play with Kobe. So. Wait, so you actually, you were playing, you played against him then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We used to, you know, we would have uh, scrimmages all the time with those guys. And uh, actually the, the highlight of my personal basketball career was uh, my senior year, his junior year. There was like the local three on three tournament. And my team beat his team in the finals to win the championship. But the reason why is that um, they had this really crappy rule that you could foul out. And so one of the guys on his team fouled out, not him, but one of the other guys. But even with him playing three on two and a half court, you could get wide open 12 foot shots. And so and you could double team him. So so we won. So we won the championship. And what was crazy was years later, when I first started StockX, and I was putting together the first kind of strategic round where we had a lot of these big names um, and we can talk more about it, but it was like Eminem, Mark Wahlberg, um, you know, uh, Drake, et cetera. We had this, this you know, sort of high profile uh, uh, round that we did. And I reconnected with Kobe um, and talked to him and told him what we were doing. And, you know, we sat down and, and by the way, so that was in 1995, that, that, that tournament. Mm -hmm. And now we're in 2016. And, um, and I was like, hey, I was like, do you remember? And he's like, yeah, that bullshit championship that you guys won. He's like, that was a horrible rule. How do you foul out in a three-on-three -three game? This is this is 21 years later, uh, the whole thing. So I was like, hey, man, I got the ring. So that's that's a, that's amazing. I, it's that it does seem like a crazy rule. Like you don't have. I guess on a three-on-three, -three, there's no subs, right? Or maybe you just that's your team. You have. Three well, guys I think they've evolved three-on-three -three since then. But in 1995, yeah. that was the rule at this local tournament, oh, and like it's a horrible true. rule. That's pretty amazing, though. I, I would have to imagine Kobe at that time even was just so good that that still it must have been a close match down a down. Oh, a, it was still close. Yeah, but for sure. But you know, if you're if you can make twelve foot jumpers, then you're gonna win because two guys yeah. can't guard three guys in a half court. That's true. That is uh, that's yeah, very true. Well, so StockX, uh, it goes through. You do. How was that when you said, "All right, we're moving to Michigan. We're moving to Detroit." You know, by the way, I will say Detroit is becoming a. And then I would love to take a second to talk about how, how much I love Detroit. Cause I, over the last few years, it really has emerged. And Dan Gilbert's credited a lot with that, with how much money he's put in, how much he's invested, but it's really come a long way. I mean, I think when people still hear Detroit, like globally, even in the U S you know, maybe not so much in Michigan, people think it's like a, you know, ghetto. It's like not nice. It's really, I mean, Detroit has come a long way. I think anyone who went to goes to Detroit, that doesn't really know much about it would be very shocked at how much the restaurants, the the scene, it's changed the areas. I mean, the sports, there's new stadiums. I mean, it's vibrant. Uh, in my opinion, I don't know what you would say if you could, and do you feel that that's true that Detroit kind of gets a bad rap still, even though it's, it's definitely. Well, I think I, I, it certainly did. And I mean, even, you know, when I, when I was going there, you know, I'm with Dan on my way to Detroit and I realized I've never been to Detroit. I, I have no concept. I'm like, am I going to meet Isaiah Thomas? Like that was my only concept for, for Detroit, you know? Um, but it's, it's extraordinary. It's literally living in a, in a startup city because every day there's a new restaurant, there's a new building, there's new companies. And, um, and obviously, you know, COVID notwithstanding the, um, you know, from when I got here in, in 2015 till now, it's night and day. Um, and had it not been for COVID, you know, it would be, you know, still day to day, you know, growing, but, um, but you grew up in Ann Arbor, right? Yeah. Born and raised in Ann Arbor. Yep. And so, so you probably had some experience of, uh, coming here at least on occasion, right. And seeing mm -hmm. what it was like back then. So I got to imagine it was, I mean, couldn't have been, you know, more extraordinary, the, the difference from then to now. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not recognizable. I mean, you just wouldn't really go. I mean, I remember going to like some Tigers games, uh, you know, a couple, uh, going there for once in a while, but yeah, it wasn't something you would go and, and do. And I mean, the casinos, even now there's the sports teams, the, the restaurants are great. And it just, it, it's, it really is. It's nice. Like I would actually say it's nice and it just oh, yeah. keep growing and, and sort of uh, from the center, just sort of moving, moving outward. So it's, uh, you know, and again, Dan, definitely the, the largest investor, at least that I'm aware of, or one of them that he's poured a lot of money in developing the city, I'm sure done very well yeah. in the process of investing, but he's really, he has given a lot. And I think, you know, you almost think, that name Dan Gilbert synonymous with Cleveland and Detroit. I mean, he's yeah. almost, I think it's almost confusing like that you would think he's an owner of, 
Detroit's franchises because how much he's done and and puts in puts in here. Um, well, yeah. So so how was that when you decided? Like, was that a, like all right, here we go? Is that would you get any resistance or was it just like all right, this is the next step? No, I, you know, my wife's always been unbelievably supportive of uh, of all my my startups and crazy ideas and and you know, like I said I walked in the door and I said you know, I think we're moving to Detroit and we stayed up talking and you know after I told her what had happened over those two days she was like. Yeah, like I think we're moving to Detroit, you know, and um, you know, and we live in in a uh, a nice suburb um, that is you know as nice as any suburb in any city. I mean, there's three parks within walking distance for my kids. Like it's it's a great place to to raise a family. Um, but you know, on the for down, downtown, it was really um, it couldn't have been uh, more just you know welcoming as a new startup coming into this ecosystem and having Dan and his whole uh, you know mini empire of the, all the companies that he owns or is part of or is invested in or buildings. And in the beginning, we absolutely benefited from all of that. Um, we took advantage of as much as we could. Uh, we asked everybody for help. And then eventually it started to turn and we became the, you know, the, the big shining tech company from Detroit and, um, and hopefully have been able to help others along as well. But I remember the first day, you know, our office is in the same building as Dan and Quicken Loans. And, um, and I remember the first day that I walked into the, the lobby and there was a stock X sign and IBM or uh, Microsoft's in the building. So it's like it, the signs were always Quicken Loans, Meridian and uh, Microsoft. And I walked in one day and there was a stock X sign underneath it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do it. I don't even know who I still don't know who did it to this day. But I was like, oh, shit. I was like, that's awesome. I was like, that's really cool. I was like, you know, I was like, we're, we're part of this. And, and then it prompted me to go ask the Quicken Loans people. Cause you know, they own the building. And I was like, I was like, Hey, how do I get our sign on the outside of the building? I want one of those big signs. I was like, what do we like? We just have to buy it. I'm like, Oh, I was like, all right, done. I was like, we're, we're absolutely doing that. I was like, if I had known it was that simple, we would have bought this years ago. Right. Um, and so now I've like on the that, outside I've of the building, that, I've seen a, a sign out there, actually the stock X on the, one of the buildings down there. Maybe there's yeah. more than one, but I've seen it on the, the building in a very nice area location. And when you, when you went with him, I would imagine you guys, did you fly? So you actually went to the game, you booked commercial or, or whatever, or you, you get, went to Cleveland from Philadelphia. And then did you guys just like literally that day after the game, did you hop on a plane and go to Detroit with his plane or was it the next yeah. day? Or you no, no. I mean, we, we went right from the, right from the arena. Um, I had, I had had a hotel. They had got me a hotel so I could, you know, take right. a shower and stuff. So we, we went back to the hotel. I grabbed my bags and then went with Dan right there and, and went with him on his plane and, and flew right home and to Detroit. And so that night, uh, you know, they put me up in, uh, one of the hotels that Dan owns and, um, yeah. And so I, I, I went to Cleveland and I thought I was going to come home. And next thing I know, I'm sleeping in Detroit. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I was there for three days. Like I wore the same clothes for three days. Right. Like I, I didn't, you know, I mean, if I was there any longer, I was gonna have to go to, you know, Target and get some boxes or something. Like something. I, tell me you got that outfit. Yeah. You must have saved what you were wearing. That's gotta be a lucky uh lucky. My deal. wife still like still says, you know, because she made me wear uh, like a button-down shirt for it. You know, she's like, You're gonna go meet, you know. This I, I was like, All right, all right. So I like I wore a button-down shirt, but like I know exactly what shoes I wore, I wore the Tiffany Dunks. Um and uh but yeah, I mean, what was I going to do? I was going to be like, no, I got to like go home. Oh, you roll with it. And of course. You know, you of course. It. It's, a, it's a legendary story. It really is. It's pretty, pretty exciting. When you got the terms done, everything came together. What was the, give me an idea of what it looked like. Cause you had your camp list. You said 17 sort of mm -hmm. members of people involved mm -hmm. in the process. Did all those 17 carry over to the start with StockX plus what, like, how did that look on day one of StockX? Who was, how, how much has it grown from there until, you know, you recently have now, uh, which will we'll cover you. You're, you're stepping into some other stuff and you have no longer with StockX at the moment, but like, give me the idea up until mm -hmm. you just left and where it is when you started yeah. day one, how did that work? How there were, um, you know, there were four people. So I was number five. Um, and then um, the next day we uh, had number six. And then the first person that we hired um, other than the people that were there was actually my brother. And my brother had been working with me at Campless. And he knew um, enough about sneakers and data and, um, you know, and content. And uh, uh, so, um, and I, I remember Dan and then uh, Greg Schwartz, who's the StockX COO and the third co-founder, um, you know, kind of pulled me aside and we were like, all right, walk us through, like, why are we hiring your brother? You know, 
as they should, you know, be like the first person you want to hire is, is your brother. Um, but you know, he was, he just had the most knowledge to be able to do that. So he could keep campus running while the rest of us were building stock X and turning it into stock X because mm -hmm. it was important to be able to bring in that audience and, and that data and everything else in there. And then Matt, my brother has since done, uh, you know, I don't know about every job uh, there is, but in the beginning, it's a true startup thing and everyone's doing everything. But, um, you know, there were seven of us at, and prior to StockX, the most people that ever worked for any of the companies I started was 12. And at one point, StockX had over 1200 people. So to go from, from that, you know, from the, the five of us, seven of us sitting outside of Dan's office, and we literally sat like right outside of his office and we just had our desks just plan out there so he could walk by at any given time and see what was going on. And sometimes you, you know, get into the, the financial model. Other times he'd just be like, why is the font, you know, gray on this thing? And, which was fine. It was great to have him so in the weeds and involved in that um, for it. Eventually we, we outgrew that area and we, we had to um, get our own space. But um, yeah, I mean, it was slow, obviously in the beginning, you know, you add a couple people to, um, uh, you know, just to, just to keep going. But at some point, uh, it flipped. And uh, because we authenticate all the products at StockX, and now there's actually nine authentication centers around the world, um, that and that continues to scale. And then we also need a lot of customer service people as well. So, you know, StockX actually does employ, you know, a, a, a fairly large number of people because of that part of the business. Right. And give me, you know, again, I, I just want to kind of understand a bit more about, uh, I guess, you know, Dan Gilbert, he obviously had a, a stroke last year. I mean, that was covered and you know, he's in terms of being day to day or what he's able to do. And, you know, that, that, that incident happened, but with, you're talking about how, how he was day to day. I mean, give me an idea, like what he's doing when you were there. Like, is he, he's man, I mean, I don't even know how many businesses and he has to be one of the most successful businessmen, entrepreneurs, quick and loans, does all kinds of other stuff. Is he in the office and, and is he like involved for part of the day? Does he get on calls with, with the stock X or did he just kind of know this idea was great, let you guys sort of do it. And he was just sort of overseeing it. Like how, how much was he involved in that? And, and how much did you see him kind of in the office and working? Like yeah. I'm just trying to picture how a guy like that really, you know, I guess you just, you hire great people, right? You have managers or, you know, yeah, you know, I, I, companies, but like, is he like on, you know, is he just there and he was around doing his thing? Like, cause that's, yeah, it seems pretty surreal to be like right side of his office. And it's like his uh, kind of one of his baby startups. but he does a lot of startups, right? I mean, a fair amount. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, it is like I, I've never um, been that close and had that much access to someone at that level before. I mean, you can really think of it those three three time periods, right? There was, you know, the startup period, um, and then there was, you know, the growth period, and then there was post stroke. Um, and obviously, you know, post stroke, um, and he's he's doing great now, but he is, um, and obviously in the COVID world, but you know, he just removed himself entirely um, from you know from the day to day and was not in the office and. Um, and which is, uh, I'm sure was the best thing for him from a health situation, uh, to do that because prior to that, you know, Dan owns all or part of, I, I think it's somewhere in between hundred to 130 companies. I, you know, it's always changing. Um, and with significant real estate in Detroit and Cleveland, uh, and I'd imagine other places. So you just can't physically do all that no matter how much, but that said, like he was as hands-on as, as anyone could be, uh, you know, across all that. But for StockX in the very beginning, for that maybe year and a half that we sat outside of his office, when we grew from, from five until we were about 20 people, um, he was, I mean, we would have regular meetings with him. You know, uh, he was involved in like as much as he, as he could be, way more than I ever imagined. Um, but, but even for the beginning, he was always that, you know, this is your company, you know, you guys are running it. Um, and you can't manage anything at that scale if you don't do that. But I remember when we launched StockX and, uh, and for our launch and our launch article, um, we, for the press, uh, we had them come in and they interviewed Dan, they interviewed me. There's all these pictures of, of us. And I remember like the very first press that request that came in right after that, immediately following, we went right back to him and said, all right, you know, we got this, this, and this, do you want to do this interview? And he's like, no, he's like, I did the, the launch because it was important. He goes, but this is you and Greg, like from here on out, you guys are doing it. Like I shouldn't be in the articles. It should be about you guys. It should be about the company. And, um, and it was really great like that. And, you know, then from there forward, he really functions as the board in, you know, in the same way that, you know, any company would involve the board for certain board level decisions, um, you know, funding high level strategic things. 
um, but not be involved in the day to day. But I do think because this was truly him having the exact same idea as me. Mm -hmm. And independently, we didn't know each other, obviously. So he is a true co-founder in every sense. He was also the the largest investor um, for a while, but also a, a co-founder. So he played multiple roles and and um, and yeah, I believed in the idea as much as anyone. Where does uh, where do you believe uh, StockX within his portfolio? Because Quicken Loans, he's the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers. You know, he does some other major stuff. Uh, StockX is now what is it? It's it's valued. It's like two point four billion or more. I don't even know. It's a multi billion dollar company, correct? Is that is that the yep. current sort of? Um, you know, where does that? Because in terms of ROI, I would have to imagine it's one of the biggest. Because like when you start StockX, you're like you know, I don't know if it's public information or not, but in terms of the amount of investment and in startup where it was and where it is, what, five, six years later now, uh, it's pretty incredible, right? I mean, could you ever, yeah. did you imagine, you know, you saw the data, you knew sneakers are kind of the market big, but did you ever think that this could become so big? Like, is this, like you said no. today, that was that like in your, on your realm of expectation? No, I mean, you know, we, we don't know the exact valuation. It's not a public company, but, um, you know, last summer uh, is when we did the round that valued the company at, at uh, 1.1 billion. The company has grown a lot since then. So it, it's some number north of, of 2 billion. Um, but no, like there's no, by the way, like we're now bigger than what we thought the entire resale market was. Mm-hmm. That we, the, when we started StockX, we had valued the entire resale market at 1.1 billion. All right, and now, you know, we're more than double of what we thought the, the whole market was. So no, you can't possibly Imagine that, but but to answer your your question about Dan, um, and obviously I don't have you know specific numbers, but obviously Quicken's number one, and Quicken um, and what's what's now called uh, Rock family of companies just went public uh, a couple months ago, um, so that's clearly number one. And I think his real estate business Bedrock would have to be two, just in terms of total assets, mm-hmm. because they own you know I I don't know it's got to be maybe around 100 buildings in downtown Detroit um, and other cities. But in terms of ROI, I got to imagine because, you know, he's only actually started a handful of businesses, Quicken being one and StockX being the other. Um, and then, you know, a couple other, you know, smaller things. But this is, you know, being a, a actual co-founder in there from the beginning when the value of the company was literally zero. Um, you know, this has got to be up there. Right. Very. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's very cool. Very, very crazy. And and again, uh, I want to segue into sports cards here quickly, but let's yep. just. Last thing on StockX, could you explain a little bit? I believe my, I saw my notes. I believe there's over a hundred um, kind of analysts or people that look at the the shoes and know if they're they're real uh, or something like that. But but also, it's not just sneakers, correct? Because it's StockX. Sneakers is right. like what I think of as as, but it's not really you know sort of like an eBay. There are other items, sports cards being one of them. What are sort of the major markets? Shoes, sports cards. Is that number two, or what? What sort of the order of uh, items? No, I mean I think sports cards can ultimately be you know as big as sneakers, but sneakers is one by far. Um, the second biggest category is streetwear. So you know you have Supreme, which is the brand that really drives the majority of that. Um, and then uh, you know collectibles is um, is a really big category. And you know even though today trading cards is part of that. Um, what I really mean are like the, the collectible toys. So you have cause and bear brick, um, supreme accessories, skate decks, things like that, um, that are, are really big as well. Um, you know, it's called StockX, not SneakerX, because it was always about this idea of creating a, what we call a stock market of things, but it's a marketplace that brings buyers and sellers together in the same way that the stock market does that and leverages a lot of the same stock market mechanics with regard to data, transparency of data, um, the way that we get to uh, a sale. And that's the real business. I mean, the reason that it's grown that much, I mean, obviously sneakers are a big part of it, um, but it is about this unique uh, business model that outside of the actual stock market, no one has yet uh, copied. It, it truly doesn't exist anywhere else yet. It's not to say that people won't copy it or, or try to, um, but yeah. And so those are the main categories. And, and we added trading cards um, about a year ago. And uh, I think trading cards uh, will ultimately do really well. Um, it's still super early. And, you know, the primary focus of the business is still um, sneakers and the other categories, just because that's how um, that self works. And there's still so much growth in sneakers because what's happened is from the time that we started till now, the idea of a resale and a retail sneaker market, the primary and secondary markets have really blurred a lot. 
So now that person doesn't care if it's a retail or resale shoe. They don't care how much they pay for it. Like they just know they want this particular shoe. They're willing to pay this amount of money. And so whether they buy it from Foot Locker or Nike or StockX is completely irrelevant. And once those distinctions start to go away, then it doesn't really matter how big we think the resale sneaker market is. The retail market we know globally is about $100 billion. And so now that's the pool that we're playing in. And so now being you know, a, a company that's what it was worth whatever, two or three billion, like we got a long way to go and a lot of opportunity, particularly globally, as you now say, hey, we can sell sneakers to anyone in the world. It doesn't just have to be people that want hype Air Jordans or Yeezys or or those really hype shoes. It can be somebody that just wants a pair of sneakers. Um, yeah, it's super interesting. The oh, since we do have it here, there is actually the StockX trading cards, which has uh, gone pretty. You know, it's uh, it seems like it's growing very quickly as well. Tell me a bit about how this got born within StockX. Is this something that this you know StockX started? Let's say 2015 or 16. When did the sports cards actually become like a part of the the StockX culture and how do you, where's your love for sports cards currently and, and what's your involvement with that at the moment? Yeah. So, um, it was, uh, it was the end of 2018 that, um, I started really looking at cards as a potential product to put on StockX. Um, you know, we were always looking for what products, what categories might be good to, as we expand. Um, and at the time I was still CEO and, um, you know, I've collected you know, cards when I was a kid, but, you know, I haven't, you know, collected cards um, again for many years. And what happened kind of a, a I'll, I'll keep the, the story short, but really just a, a funny story was Thanksgiving of 2018, my wife and I decided to drive to Philadelphia to be with my parents for Thanksgiving, for whatever reason, we put the two kids in the, in the minivan, and uh, who, they were six and three at the time, 10 hour drive. We drove oh, home. I've done that many times, literally that's 15 years as a kid, we drove to Philadelphia. We actually yeah. The same exact thing yeah and well so the now we got many other things on our, our uh, similarity list besides yes. uh bubblicious here um yeah. but uh so we get home and my mother noticing the opportunity says oh you drove home and you have your big minivan you're taking all your baseball cards out of my basement and i was like okay fair enough you know they've been sitting there since 1995 when i graduated high school Right. You know, and so I was like, okay. Uh, and, and so I loaded up, you know, the minivan, you know, at the end of the weekend. And I spent the next month, every night, going through all my old cards, reliving my childhood card by card. And that was a major impetus for me to really start looking at trading cards as potential for StockX. And it took a little time just to get it up on the site. But, uh, you know, as you know, and, and I'm sure uh, a lot of your listeners are, are uh, starting to see, you know, trading cards are what's next. Trading cards are the next sneakers in terms of this product that sits at the intersection of culture and commerce. And, um, and e you know, even the similarities in, in the people and the, uh, the celebrities, the athletes, like at the center of both industries is Michael Jordan. It's all about like our generation of people coming back into this hobby. Like, the, it, like what's going on in trading cards right now is exactly what it looked like in 2013 for sneakers when I was out there pushing campus saying, hey, there's a really big business under this in sneakers. And half the people got it and were interested. And the other half said, sneakers, like, that's never going to be a big business. Like, my kids like sneakers. Like, well, right. okay. And, like, that's kind of what's happening right now as our generation is rediscovering trading cards, whether on their own, as an investment, through their kids. Um, and, and, and literally, it's, it's, the same it's the same look that people give me when I tell them about trading cards today is what it was like in, in 2013. And so it's a really extraordinary uh, corollary. And for StockX, trading cards may actually be a more perfect product because you mentioned, you know, authentication and the authenticators that work at StockX authenticating sneakers. Well, that's one of several things that we have to do to essentially take consumer goods, sneakers, streetwear, watches, handbags. These are all consumer goods. They're not assets. They're not investments. But we, we squint our eyes a little bit and, and we... we do something a little bit and make it fit in the stock market model. For sneakers, we authenticate them, right? And for trading cards, though, trading cards already are assets. They already are investments and they already are standardized because there are third party systems, the grading companies that authenticate and grade the companies. Right. So you have this product that's really perfect to be traded on a stock market exchange. 
then that's what what StockX is. But it's like all, any business, also a lot more easy. You know, you look here. I mean, to, and look at your background. You got all these. It looks very beautiful. You got to show the the viewers here as well. Your your other side. That you you know, we got the we got the B. Which I think is the best background I've seen yet on on here. But your your A thing over there. That that's crazy, man. That gets me excited. That makes me want to get into shoes. But it's a lot easier to hold these individual cards. You know, like oh yeah, it's, it's like you can ship it, you can hold it, you can carry it in a backpack. You know, you're talking about two three pair of shoes. It becomes a little bit inconvenient to start taking around your. Oh yeah carrying around so that that also i think is uh yeah it's a it's a much easier way to uh sort of you know tangibly hold and and, and move around assets so i think that well but but also and this is the most important thing is like look i wouldn't give up this for anything right i love sneakers and and like but tomorrow everything in here is worth less than it is today like they're not sneakers are not long-term assets it's still even if you store it perfectly it's still just rubber and leather and glue and and so it's not a long-term asset but trading cards trading cards actually are assets and investments and that is a really big distinction when you think about how big the market can get how much money can go into it and and this is the distinction between like collectibles and memorabilia um, versus assets right so like spending twenty thousand dollars on a michael jordan rookie card is not the same thing as spending twenty thousand dollars on a jordan autographed jersey right a, a jersey it's cool and it's valuable and it's almost definitely going to be worth more tomorrow than today, but it's not standardized. It's not liquid. It's not easily transferable. Like we, it's not easy to authenticate. Like all of those things. And so, as a consumer, if you want to buy a Jordan jersey, that's money that comes out of some discretionary budget of things that you spend money on. What a Jordan rookie? That's an investment. So that's moving twenty thousand dollars from a Vanguard mutual fund into this and just diversifying your investments completely different mentality of where that money comes from and, and how much can go there. And that's really like the key of why trading cards are about to become, I truly, I, I think that the biggest thing in, in culture, commerce, finance, all of it over the next couple of years. Yeah, it's uh, I, I'm with you on that. I'm, we have also similar with that. I collected in the early 90s. I had all the 93, 94 Fleer Ultra. Uh, one of my favorite things is one of our very good mutual friends, Jason Kuntz, uh, T-Show, Tony, who you also know, T-Show, um, said he had told me about Jason. And finally I was, when I was home one time, it was like nine 30 at night and we got on the phone. Cause like I, he had a question about some course. I was talking about doing a subscription model for some poker stuff that I do. You know, I do Twitch, I do some other stuff. We had this idea. And then he goes, yeah, Jason, I think did one with Negranu and asked him about it. So he called him, we started talking. And then next thing you know, we started talking about sports cards and I was like, you know what I got, I'm here. It's nine 30 at night, but why don't we round up my stuff. You live like 30 minutes from my parents. I got all my old cards, brought them over. And we, t show and I were there till three or four in the morning and we had fun and we were meeting. And like, I, I remember, I'll never forget when I took them out in the box, he was like, yeah, those are probably worth a buck a card. And uh -huh. I had like all the Kobe's, all the Michael Jordan's like, you know, yeah. organized in the thing. They weren't graded, but they were in like, you know, clean box. And it was like with name tags and each player. And I was like, oh, a hundred of a card. That's pretty cool. Like that's about what I thought. And they was like, no, it's a dollar a card. And I was like, all right, well, you know that, and then I saw his stuff, and he had all the coolest shit I ever seen, and the two hundred and fifty, you know, thousand dollar Michael Jordan jersey, game worn Olympic sign, this and that, all the other stuff, and like I got a kind of obsessed because it brought back the memories and seeing the gradings. You know, it's so cool, like the eight or a nine or a ten, and how the value differs. And similar to poker, where I can relate, anyone can get in. You want a Jordan yep. rookie eighty six Fleer, and it's a four. You can get it. You want a 10, it's a hundred grand now, or nine's 30, or uh, yeah, nine's 20 grand. But like, if you similar to poker, you want to go play 100, 200, yeah, you know, it's not for everyone. And most people don't have the money to sit down and buy in for 10, 20 grand. But if you want to go play $1, $2, you can get in and you can start yep. somewhere. So, like, that I also think is so valuable where the disparity and the, the different difference in the, the where you can get in, you know, anyone can start and kind of flip and, and go through the business and work hard and, and start with very little and get involved in the industry, which I think is very, very, uh, you know, that's appealing. And that's, that's nice. Like you can literally just do that. Yeah. No matter what your income is or what your, your revenue is. Your so. story, your story is, is that is why the industry is blowing up because we all have that same story. We all have gone through, that same process of going through everything. Kunz did the same thing for me. He went through everything. And for some reason, I, I collected Willie Mays as a kid. He's like, the Willie Mays stuff is valuable. The rest of it's all junk, right? The rest of it's all worth. We, we all have that. We all have all of our cards sitting. Like over the last couple of months, as I've been telling people that I'm, I've left StockX to go into cards and all this stuff, 
nine out of 10 people literally mid conversation will be like, hold on, I need to text my mother to have her go like find my cards in the basement. And like, that's the key. Like what you went through is, is, is we're all doing it. And that's why this thing is, is all going extraordinary. By the way, I, I like the, the poker analogy is dead on, right? Um, and I think there's a, there's a lot of, of similarities in, um, in a lot of this from, from cards, like, you know, Jason, who is, you know, not as uh, much of a professional as, uh, as you are, but has played some big tournaments and, and plays it at a higher level than, than most people. And I think there's some similarity in the, um, just in the, the risk reward around investing in cards and, and being able to, to take those big bets that he does for both cards, you know, and for poker. So I do, I do see some of that similarity. Yeah, Jason, got to give him, give him some credit. He's better at his hobby than my profession. I play a lot of tournaments. He has a bigger score lifetime. He has a million dollar score at, uh, you know, does it once every five years and I and grind and that, that's sometimes how it works. But you know, I think also there are some people, depending on what you collected, there is there is some buried treasure out there, no doubt. Like yeah. I, or even that do have it from the 70s or 80s or 60s, you know, laying around. And I think that's that's fun. Jason says sometimes they do find like a huge hit or someone does have stuff, but most of the guys' stuff are the wrong era. They just, you know, don't have it or whatever. It's sort of like Bitcoin too. I feel like there's lost and there is stuff that's waiting there to be uncovered some. But you know, market cap wise, I think the card industry is it's much smaller though. Is that like what I, I saw an estimate like five billion, maybe it's seven or eight billion? Like, what do you what do you think is currently in the uh, card card? Market? Yeah, it it's been hard. No one's been able to, to really get a good number. The last number that I saw someone put out, there's they estimated five billion. The problem is that you know eBay is still the largest marketplace uh, by far, and there's some auction houses and and eBay and the, that the auction house data is relatively accessible, but so much of it still happens privately. So much of it still happens at card shows. Um, and, um, you know, and it's hard to get a handle on that. Also, you have cards just constantly going up in value. So it's hard to say, you know, the difference between the market value and the assets that exist that are out there, right? The, you know, sneakers as a consumer good, it's much different because once that sneaker is sold and then worn, it's essentially out of the market. Whereas the card, well, the card's not out of the market. It just happens to be sitting at someone's. So I don't know if, if you know, if 10% more people decide, you know, they want to sell some cards, um, you know, next month, what does that do to the, the market size, right? It probably goes up by more than 10% because those cards have now gone up more in value than when they first bought it. Um, all that is to say, um, I had a, a conversation with the founder of uh, WorthPoint and WorthPoint is a company that tracks uh, data in eBay and other places. And, um, and I asked him this, this exact question. I'm like, look, this is your job. You've been doing this forever. I was like, what do you think the size of, of the trading card market is? And, um, and he, I think his, his line was something, I forget exactly, but his line was like, it's real fucking big and it's limitless. And I'm like, okay, and I'm like, that's good enough for me. Right. Um, and yeah, it's not the size of Bitcoin. It's not the size of, of the stock market, but we're, we're just at the beginning of, I think where it gets to. And like, once you recognize that these are real assets, you know, people just start to treat them much different. Yeah, I, this, I, I've thought of this similar, but my, one of my very good friends who was excited, saw you on the podcast names is, is Bryce. Um, he asked this question and I, and I like how he worded it, but he was basically saying, I think it's inter interesting to look at scarcity versus utility. Cards don't have utility, but are certainly scarce. How do you keep people caring about scarce items without utility like gold? Is that, is that a... I don't, I mean, I think it's arguable whether gold has utility to the, to the user, right. Um, or even diamonds when right. you have a perfectly good substitute, right. From a, uh, you know, you can wear a CZ and no one would ever possibly know the difference. Um, yeah, there, there is no, there is no utility, but there's no utility in, uh, in just about any, um, you know, alternative asset art. What's the, what's the utility in art? Um, and art is a really good comp for cards like you can think of cards kind of sitting between art and stocks on the alternative asset spectrum because there is some similarity to art in that you know it's based on some level of how you feel about this particular card and and um and the the collective demand we have for that like there is a, a collective demand for for certain like even different works of art of the same artist right for whatever reason we like this one better than that one and it has more more value but they're also tied to, to a company underlying it. Like there's a reason why LeBron cards are worth more than, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
Alex Caruso cards, right? I mean, it, you know, and so, and there is some standardization around it as well. So art's a pretty good way to look at it. And at a macro level, I think what's going on is we're at the point where people can invest in cards almost like, it's almost like if you were investing in art before people realized that art was actually an alternative asset. Like today we accept art as an alternative asset and somewhere that is, is acceptable to, to put a couple million dollars as an investment. But could you imagine like buying art when Picasso was painting paintings and, and some people were saying, hey, this stuff's really valuable. We should buy his paintings. But half the world saying, my daughter makes paintings. So I'll just buy her painting, right? Like that's the like the mentality that we're still in right now. But like once enough people recognize that, no, there was a really big difference between, you know, my daughter's painting and Picasso's painting or between trading cards and jerseys or the other places that, that look like that, um, you know, it, it just becomes it. But all things of value are value because that we collectively say they are right. There, there is no function to a dollar bill, but currency has become the default standard of, of, uh, of paying for things. For sure. All right. Give me your, give me your, uh, biggest, sh what, what's your most prized shoe? Uh, you said you have, what do you have like close to 400 pairs, maybe more. Is that, is that right? What's your, is there one that you love the most and also what's the most valuable? Well, the most valuable, uh, is certainly, um, I have a, a pair of shoes called the, um, Air Jordan 4 Carhartt, which is a collaboration between the brand Carhartt and m and m and Air Jordan. And at the time there were only 10 pairs released to the public. They sold for uh, thirty thousand dollars a pair. Um, they're now worth. Uh, there were more that were made, and this pair was given to me by Paul Rosenberg and Eminem when, uh, as I mentioned, he was an investor in StockX. Both of them were investors in StockX in the very beginning. So the shoe sells for about fifteen grand right now. Uh, I've worn it several times. I have no interest in selling it. It's more of a to me a, a memory of a memorabilia of our relationship and him being part of StockX. But from a pure value standpoint, like that's definitely the most valuable. So that you're saying it was 30,000. Now it's 15,000 or because yeah, so when they, when they more. first came out, when they first came out, uh, there were only 10 pairs that released to the public and they were sold on eBay as an auction. This was actually right before StockX launched. And so at the time they sold for 30,000 hours a piece. And, um, but since then the value of them has come down to about 15,000 because there were others that were made and have found their way into the market. So. Very, very interesting. Okay. And what about cards? What's your, uh, what's your prize card? If you, if you don't mind sharing or give me one of them, if not your most. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I, if I had just a tiny bit of foresight, I would have actually pulled out a bunch of cards uh, and had them here, but, um, you know, God, there, there's so many. Um, but I, I do say that, um, for me, it's gotta be the uh, 52 tops Willie Mays rookie, which was given to me by my parents for my bar mitzvah when I was 13 years old. Uh, and I still have, I since have had it graded and, uh, you know, it came back, a a, uh, five, which was, uh, which was great. Um, but like, what is, that, what is that card worth roughly within a five, just to have an idea. Uh, I'd have to, I'd have to look, but my guess is maybe like, uh, I don't know, like four or five grand probably. Um, mm -hmm. I got a double take, but I, I didn't, I didn't buy that one. Right. I mean, I mean, that was given to me in, in, 19, yeah. in 1991. Uh, mm -hmm. and there's just so much because as a kid, for some reason, uh, I was into Willie Mays. So all my collection is exactly what everyone else had from the late 80s and early 90s and and all, you know, the, the junk wax. And then this collection of Willie Mays is, and that was the prized possession of, of all the Willie right. Mays. So, cool, uh, so that, that's definitely it. That. Willie Mays just sounds kind of gangster. Like it just, cool. yeah. he was uh, even like, you don't know, I don't know much about his career, but I know he was a Hall of Famer and an absolute legend, uh, legendary player. And, you know, just sort of seems cool. Like the name sounds fun. And I know he's a- yeah. Yeah, I, and, and, and the fact that you didn't actually buy it, it basically was, uh, yeah, it arrived to you and hopefully I'm sure they got a great deal or, you know, at the time it wasn't, cards weren't really that expensive even then, even if it was like, maybe they got it from a store and paid a couple bucks or 10 bucks or hundred bucks or something, but, uh, yeah. whatever it was, yeah, that's, that's, that's very cool. And that's one I'm sure you don't want to, don't want to sell. Do you find yourself yep. having a problem, uh, thinking about releasing? Cause like I've, yeah. I've gotten so into cards in the past few years as well. And, and, you know, it's done very well. The industry has gone up a lot. Um, but it, like, I don't really see, like, I guess it, it's almost like I would think of like hard times if I'm ready to sell now, of course, you know, getting rid of a few cards here and there, or sometimes buying two to 10, I'll sometimes get of the same one and looking at sort of an investment and then it's not a hard, but like, it, it just seems kind of hard to let go. Right. Like, are you still in like a hoarding state? Like of just collect, uh, I would actually flip if I, stuff? if I could, I would never sell anything. It is the most painful thing. Um, and I've sold a fair amount over the past year, but everything was just 
so I could buy something else that I wanted more. And, uh, and, but even so, even going through that process, it's, uh, it, it's painful and rough. And yeah, I don't regret anything that I've bought. I regret so much that I've sold. I regret so much that I passed up not buying. Um, but at some point you just physically can't buy any more cards, um, right. which is part of the reason that I left StockX to create businesses in the trading card space, because you know, there's only so many I could buy personally. So, you know, how else can I create value? How else can I be involved in the industry? Is there a site like StockX? Because when I see StockX here for trading cards and you see how it works and you know, it's sort of a marketplace with uh, bidding and, and how it all goes down. Is there a, can you like click on a card and see like the history of the card? Is there actually like a tracker, like a lot real time card that shows you like what the, because you know, that, that to me would be fascinating um, to be able to like, see what the latest card sold for and that exact card at the different gradings. Like, is there something like that or being created? Or anything, all this yeah, thing? there's, there's, um, there's a couple companies that I would see, uh, that I would consider kind of similar to campless and that they are pure, you know, data companies that are tracking sales price across many different channels to create that, that price guide. Um, there's probably about a half a dozen that are decent that are out there doing that. Um, there's one that I like a lot that's called card ladder. Um, and I, I think Card Ladder does a really good job of of bringing in data. I think they have a pretty good UI. Um, and, but I think all of the one out there, all all of them out there, are still uh, competing to see who becomes the winner and who can create the you know the fully comprehensive um, database. Mm -hmm. But like you know, you you hit the nail on the head, and that's one of the um, really keys to the industry as it grows to have a place that we can all agree that here's the this this is the price guide. Here's how we know what what things are worth. So. Mm -hmm. Very, yeah, makes makes a lot of sense. And in StockX, the shoes they're only sealed, not brand new shoes. Is that how it works? They're not a re it's not used because I didn't understand yeah. that either. So like, so it's essentially flipping. Like you buy the shoes and then they, they, the the demand goes up and you sell it. So it's not people that have worn their shoes, want to get a new pair, or sell it, or like whatever. These are all brand new, not touched. Right. I, yeah. I didn't understand that. Is that that is how? Yeah, works? everything is brand new, uh, and so you have a couple different types of sellers. Some are certainly the just kind of flippers, people that are out there trying to uh, acquire shoes at retail that they know they can sell for for more in the secondary market. Um, but over time, as I was mentioning, you know, we've moved beyond just the the hardcore resale market. So you may have, and because StockX is anonymous, so you'll never know who the seller is on the other end of that transaction. And that's part of the reason why we authenticate all the products because. We have that seller send it to us. We make sure that it's real, that it's the right condition, brand new, um, and that it is what it's supposed to be. You know, a lot of times you'll just have a, a power seller. Maybe he's selling a couple hundred pairs of shoes a month and he sold a nine, but he grabbed a nine and a half. And so we'll double check and make sure that it is what it's supposed to be. But you have all forms of small business and some maybe have sneaker shops. Um, some maybe you have, uh, you know, consignment shops uh, or just people that have put together kind of gray market businesses. Um, by doing it. But, you know, there's a fair amount of shoes that sell in StockX that are just, you know, the same shoe you could buy if you walked into a Foot Locker. But, you know, maybe it's 100 bucks a Foot Locker and it's 95 on, on StockX, right? Stuff like that. And so is, I guess that's what's interesting to me, though, these old shoes, like I, it's hard for me to believe that there's this much shoes that are never out of the box. Like it just seems like as it's just been a thing. I mean, people like like wine, you know, people are really buying shoes in the 80s, 90s or early 2000s and they just have them in a box and now want to sell it like that it seems yeah. that doesn't make sense to me is that is that really what what's going on yeah, like, totally, totally. Pairs the same one? yeah now look finding pairs that are still brand new from the 80s or even the 90s is still pretty rare um but for sure over the last you know 10 years uh people have been doing that a lot and storing them and people understand that um you know there is value in holding shoes for a couple of years and, and selling them later but i i don't know what the number is but some overwhelming majority of the shoes that are sold on StockX are shoes that have been released in the past one month, three months, six months, whatever it is, right? Most mm -hmm. of it is more modern, but yeah, like, you know, if you want to try to find a, you know, an original pair of Jordan from 1985, like StockX is probably your best bet. How, how, uh, how big a, you know, Jordan is just so big, jump in 23. He's got his own brand. Who's the next biggest, like, give me the other kind of guys in shoes. Cause I mean, it's just crazy. Like how, you know, you think of all the guys that get shoe deals nowadays in the last 30 years, right? There's people, the big players get their shoe brand, you know, Kobe, I think he's out up there. Like was st stand out to me, Shaq, a few others maybe, but like how, how big of a, I mean, the Jordans are just, 
It's just crazy, right? Like Jordan is yeah. like, everyone has a pair of Jordans or uh, uh, multiple pairs. He's got all the different lines and things. Like how big of a, a lead is he versus like the next few guys? Like, has he got market share of what percent versus like a Kobe or a uh, Shaq or some other guys that are sort of big, like, you know, well, night and day? So back, back in, in uh, what was it? In January of 2016, which was uh, a month before the first Yeezy release. So Yeezy being, you know, Kanye shoe with Adidas. The first Kanye shoe, first Yeezy release in February 2016. Right before that moment, Nike was 96% of the resale market, basically all of it, right? Adidas, and, and of that, Jordan was like 75% of that, right? So whatever that is, 73% of that. Like, so, you know, from a, a resale market standpoint, Jordan was the whole thing. Now, since then, it's evened out a lot more, and Yeezy is a, is a very major player, and Adidas Beyond Yeezy is also relevant. But Jordan is still by far, you know, number one on the resale market on StockX uh, as a brand. But to your question on the signature shoes, you know, Nike's done a good job of creating different signature shoes at different price points for different people. But the most successful after Jordan are, are absolutely LeBron one and Kobe two. And um, and then Durant's got a line that's also been very successful. Kyrie has a line that's becoming more successful. Um, we'll see. They just gave Giannis one uh, two years ago, um, so we'll see. You know how that evolves as he evolves. Um, and you know what's interesting is that Jordan Brand has also given people shoes within Jordan Brand over the years. So Carmelo Anthony has his own signature shoe, but it's at Jordan Brand, so it's Mellow by Jordan. So. You know, Nike basketball, Nike Jordan basketball as a whole, that's the dominant place across. And then you have Yeezy over here and you have a couple other things. The Kanye, the Yeezy stuff is fascinating to me as well. I mean, there's really not been any other rapper or music or not that I'm aware of, like something like that. And I mean, to, it's safe to say that that was monumental. It looks like it's gone beyond well. That's one of the most talked about. And is that is that just a combination of branding with Kanye? But the shoe is amazing as well. Like, how did that how did that go down? Did, did you predict that when you saw it getting launched? Did you see it would be big or? Kanye had uh, two shoes at Nike with a Nike Yeezy, Nike Yeezy one and two, and each had three colorways. But uh, and they were massively successful, super rare, super valuable. They still are these iconic shoes. And it was the first time that Nike had uh, had created a shoe for a non-athlete. And um, and there's kind of this famous story where where Kanye, uh, you know, essentially wants Nike to pay him. Nike says no, so he goes to Adidas. And they launched the Yeezy Lime. And, you know, when they launched that in, in February of 16, Kanye was at the absolute peak of his powers of influence and persuasion and popularity, you know, across the world. I think this was before people, you know, questioned a lot of the things that, you know, he's done since then with regard to, you know, we don't need to go in, into politics, but, you know, into, into some of that stuff. Um, and, uh, and then you combine it with, you know, the shoes were unique. They were they were truly unique, and for for those people looking for something different, and uh, you know, Kanye is the the Michael Jordan of this generation in terms of influence and um, you know to be able to sell products and and uh, and create. Since then, um, there's been other uh, you know rappers, musicians who the brands have created smaller lines around. Uh, you know, Nike's created or, or or Jordan, Nike and Jordan have created about a half a dozen different shoes with Travis Scott, uh, all of which have been massively successful. But that's just a half a dozen different shoes, nowhere near the whole line that, that Kanye and Yeezy have. So, you know, it's just it is a different scale. Yeah, um, I had a, I had a, a Saul a Kickster Domus on the, the podcast recently, and I know you know him well. And we touch. I actually went and had ordered some custom shoes. My first ever purchase. How does that world? Tell me a bit about that. I mean, he's one of the main guys, I would imagine, in that. Yep. World. But how many how many guys like that and how popular is that because like the prices people pay in the custom shoes and you know the athletes and doing these these custom you see them in, in nfl nba these like ridiculous like art pieces on shoes is becoming the thing tell me a little bit about that world like how he, he covered it on the podcast but is that something that uh have you do you do any of that have you had some of those made what do you feel about that specific uh genre within the shoe space how big is that yeah i mean uh it's also subsided a bit in popularity from where it was maybe a couple of years ago. Um, and, you know, on one hand, anybody, you know, who can paint can, uh, can pick up and customize shoes, which is also nice that, you know, it gives people an opportunity to just, you know, 
be creative and, and do what they want to do. Um, but there are probably about a half a dozen guys that, that sit at the top of that. Um, Sal, certainly one of them. Um, you know, there's a guy uh, whose name is Mosh, M-A-C-H-E, uh, who was kind of maybe the first to really become popular and really uh, just massively talented type of guy. Uh, and he largely paints uh, as well. But you have some some of these other guys that are a more traditional shoe makers where they're literally like, you know, constructing shoes from scratch. So, um, you know, there's a, a guy named uh, who goes by the shoe surgeon uh, who's very popular, uh, does really phenomenal work, has a lot of uh, celebrity clientele. Um, another guy uh, goes by JBF Customs, who I, I think is, is massively talented. And uh, and the only two pairs of custom shoes that I own, um, one was made by Jake JBF Customs and one was made by um, the uh, the shoe surgeon. And um, and yeah, it's just a, a different way of, of creating uniqueness, of creating scarcity in an industry that values scarcity. And, and that's really the core of, of sneakers is that supply and demand difference and, and the scarcity around it. That's why certain shoes sell for thousands of dollars. And that same scarcity and that same supply and demand um, gap is what drives the trading card industry. Um, and, and one of the other many reasons of, of why those two are so similar. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, the, the, just looking at your backdrop again, can we, we got some new people in here. Can you show us the other, the 2.0 version? Can you give us one more look at that? Sorry to make For sure. That's, that's why I have a, a separate webcam here. So we, we can, this is the best part of, uh, uh, ignore the, the mess of the office, but the, the shoes themselves or the, the shoe wall themselves was, uh, yeah, was obviously special built for. Uh, how, did, how would one go about that? That looks like a, that's a custom uh, setup and job and set, like how, how elaborate is that? Like, give me an idea on what that would cost to get, like, forget the shoes in it, just the, the actual setup of that uh, closet. Yeah, it. I was super fortunate to, to find someone when I moved here who, um, uh, who, was, who does like high end closets. Right. And and, uh, and so I had a vision for what I wanted and, and we sat and worked through it. Uh, it certainly was uh, significantly more expensive than we thought it would be as any construction job would go. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the whole project ended up being about 30 grand. So um, overall, uh, not not too bad, but certainly I went into it uh, thinking that that number was going to be closer to 10. So unlimited joy, though, that, that to me, mm -hmm. I'm mean, hard to wake up. You must come in. And, and is this where you work normally or is this like yeah. your? This is your studio kind of. Well, sir, I certainly uh, now now in a COVID world, I work here 100 percent of the time. But yeah, so this is my my office, my, you know, my uh, some version of a man cave. But it's slowly becoming uh, being taken over by cards. But of course, to your point, you know, cards can be stored a whole lot easier. I mean, you can see these boxes of cards up here and, and um, you know, and everything else. So I, I want to talk about COVID for sure. Cause I think it's, it is interesting how that impacted just stuff in general, what you're doing and also the whole like work from home sort of versus office and, and how you sort of feel like that. Cause it does seem like that makes a lot more sense or even for, for a lot of people maybe thinking of ways of, oh, wow, like, why am I doing this? Or why am I going to do these meetings or fly when we could do zoom and all that? So I'm curious on, on that, but I want to ask about cards. Cause this to me, is the, the 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 tricky part that I feel like that beautiful showcase you just showed with your shoes. What I struggle with the cards is, you know, I have collecting, I'm, I'm getting them. I have some in different spots, you know, where I live and, and it's great. And it's so, they're so fun. Like looking through cards, you learn stuff, the dates, the statistics, the players, like where they went to college. You kind of just like all of it's great. How do you showcase your cards though? Like I, I like, cause in their background, even with the shoe stack, that makes yeah. sense your case and the shoes are on display but like you know if you just want to have it's kind of hard because like it's like at one point you want to like kind of show your collection you also just want to be able to see it and enjoy it but like how you you know unless it's like in a case that's locked like you wouldn't want to have in your, your your downstairs at your house like just cards laid out everywhere you know so it's kind of uh that to me is tricky like i feel like if there was a design or someone come up with like a cool way to showcase and like easily i mean you're not trying to like a guy wants to steal your stuff he's going to get it. i'm saying like just so it's not, you know, laying around for a housekeeper or, or yeah. some fingers, your kids, friends to come over and grab one. But like that to me would be the, I don't really, I haven't thought about how you can showcase like. It's hard because it, you know, it's hard because they're, they're small, right? So even if you were to create something and, and put it on your wall, if you're more than, you know, six, seven feet away from that, it's not like you're going to be able to see it very good anyway. So yeah, th I mean, there's some people that certainly will, you know, there, there's tiny little plastic stands. You can put sort of one card on it. And if you have like, you know, a shelf behind your desk, I've seen some, some guys that, uh, I've actually, a guy I was on zoom with, uh, pretty recently, you know, had shelves behind his desk and had it kind of stepped up there the way that you might have like a, you know, a small picture frame or something like that. But yeah, I mean, it's totally different. What's way, way sexier is to, 
you know, um, I don't, I don't have any cards in here, right? But it's to pull out a box like this and then like, you know, go through the cards with somebody and, and you know, so yeah, I, from a pure display is not, uh, yeah, not, not as relevant. Sneakers make good, sneakers make good display. Yeah, not yet. I think there will be some stuff. I think something could come out or, you know, you could come up with some sort of like art or in a man cave and have them in a case that's locked. But then it's kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you just you also want to look at them and touch them and not have to like, you know, whatever. But interesting. Tell me a bit about um, brick and mortar card spots. I want to give a shout out to Dan Fleshman who's been on the podcast, Steve Aoki. Um, you know, you, you and Jason, you guys were out there at Steve's. Uh, yeah, it's like a amusement park his house and, and doing the, you know, get to break some cards. And, and, and he was opening a card shop with Dan in LA, which seems to be doing very well. And it looks really cool. Love the concept. Um, so congrats to those guys. And, and tell me a little bit about that. What was your involvement with them? What were you doing in Vegas for the, uh, when you guys were breaking stuff and, and what's sort of your, your relationship with those guys? Yeah, well, so, you know, Steve and, um, and DJ Ski, who's also involved with Dan in the store, um, Steve and Ski have both been uh, investors in StockX for, for a very long time, since the, since the beginning, um, and have been friends and huge supporters of StockX and me um, through that. Um, and both of them have gotten into cards relatively recently and, um, and with through, you know, through Dan, uh, Gary, Jason, myself, um, have all, um, you know, we all collect cards together and, and help each other out. And, um, you know, and the thing in Vegas was a thousand percent. It was all Steve's idea. And, um, you know, obviously in, in the COVID world, he's traveling significantly less. And, and he said, hey, you know, let's all just get together and, and, and open cards and, and trade baseball cards, which is literally like what I used to do when I was, you know, 10 years old and have sleepovers at my friend's house. And, and we'd stay up in his basement, you know, drinking soda all night. Uh, trading baseball cards. I mean, it was, it couldn't have been more fun and more, uh, you know, innocent from, uh, it was just, you know, it was just a bunch of guys. There was, there was no women, there's no drugs, there's no alcohol. It was just sitting there and, and, and trading cards, uh, all, uh, all weekend and opening packs and, and because it's Steve, you know, filming it and everything else. So, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a blast just to do that with friends and be part of it. And the, you know, the shop is a, is a playoff that because, card shops were such a part of local communities as kids. You know, there was one walking distance in my house that I used to, to walk up there and you knew the guy that worked there and you knew all the kids from the neighborhood and it was a very community thing. And obviously, you know, that concept doesn't exist so much anymore because of e-commerce, certainly because of COVID. Um, but with cards coming back, you know, um, there's still this thing about fathers taking their sons to, to go to card shops. And like, that was such a big part of our weekends when my father would take me to a, a card shop or a card show um, and to do that. And just talking to, to Dan and seeing a lot of the pictures, a lot of that is, you know, fathers come, bringing, going there with their sons and opening packs together and, and part of it. And um, yeah, I, I just, I just love that, that Dan's doing that. And I've heard of a whole bunch of other shops opening up and I think we're going to continue seeing this as the hobby continues to grow to have more and more card shops opening, reopening around the world. Yeah. And I, and I, uh, Gary V, you mentioned earlier and obviously very, very passionate. I know it's something he sold his wine business for a nice, nice sum. And he's sort of like, all he wants to do, it seems like his cards obviously he does a lot of different things. Uh, but he, he, I watched a video. Um, I, don't, I would have to drop the link in here, but it's, uh, it was basically him t it was an hour long or two about sports cards in the first 10 or 15 minutes. One of the things he says is, you know, I'd rather show my, my 10 t uh, graded 10 Akeem Olajuwon's those 10 of those than than a Rembrandt or something of that nature. You know, it's like basically saying that this is sort of modern day, you know, sports betting is legal at a federal level. There's daily fantasy is insanely popular. There is, um, you know, just it kind of the list goes on like sports are the, the technology that the, the phone, you can get it, the live streaming, all of it, right. It just sort of all ties in together. And I think sports cards with the data, the statistics, the, the you know, whatever, just kind of all works. Right. And it's like, it just seems like, uh, Gary saying too, it's like, look, you know, I'm, I have a, a reach, I have a social presence, but he's like, in a couple of years, I'm not even going to be relevant. The guys that are, you know, like Eminem or whatever athletes, rappers, actors, I know Mark Wahlberg's big into it. And his, you know, he's, he was doing some breaks and stuff on his Instagram, like stuff like this, like the more mainstream, the more personalities, the more social influencers get involved and get kind of into it. You know, it's hard to imagine what happens when I think LeBron James does some collecting. I'm not sure exactly who does water to the point if they just have a couple of their own cards or if they're actually, you know, doing elaborate collections, Evan Mathis, good friend of mine. And, you know, through Jason, like he was in the NFL, won a Super Bowl with the Broncos. He's super deep into it. He's got his own business with it. You know, once you see some of these other guys that are 
athletes or people like start, it's hard to think how big it really could get. And that is, uh, you know, something that seems like, I think that's underrated, like uh, the, the social impact of what that would mean. Not to mention guys like yourself, me, who have children now, they're getting into sports. We used to collect cards, that whole thing we're talking about where they, they're looking like, okay, they're showing their kids. They want to start collecting again. Their kids start collecting again. And it just feels like the right place, right time. If uh, any of that in particular hit more home than other, or what would you say in terms of, is that some of the reasons you believe that it's going to grow so much? Yeah, you, you, um, you hit a lot of the, the really key points there. Um, and, you know, not to, to repeat what you're saying, but to, to add on it is, um, and to build on what I was saying earlier, it is, it is our generation of people that are at the age you know, where, you know, a lot of us are in the late thirties or entering our forties or mid forties where, you know, most people don't have a substantial amount of wealth until they get to their forties or a substantial amount of disposable income. Um, and, uh, and so now you see that those people who have that money, who can decide to put $20,000 into a Jordan rookie instead of a, a mutual fund, um, or it's because of the kids, you mentioned all the different ways that they either get exposed to or to get part of it. But then it, it's not only is it um, is it they, they have money that they can put into it or, or or just buy that Jordan rookie that you couldn't afford when you were 12 or that you've wanted all your life and you couldn't afford until now. So you have all those combining factors. But, you know, you also have, um, you know, that like one generation behind us, you know, 10 years behind me is like the Pokemon generation. And most people, again, when you're just looking at the, the general population of sort of when you get money, when you have kids, when you have, you know, and might go down this path. And by the way, what happened with cards, like, for example, for me, you know, I collected all through middle school, but then I went to high school and it wasn't cool. Right. And you won't get other stuff. You get involved in, in, in girls or sports or whatever it is. And it's not cool. But like now all the people that have money that make decisions, in companies that create culture that say what's cool, we, we are those people. We are of that age. Right. Mm -hmm. So you know, Steve Aoki and Mark Wahlberg and DJ Ski. And, and, you know, these are all the guys that create culture and they grew up collecting cards. So now all of a sudden, like what's cool, like totally flips. And that's what I mean by being at the intersection of culture and commerce, because cards cut through all those different ways. And that's also why sneakers were such a big deal and still are, is sneakers cut through every socioeconomic, every race, every, every, because everybody has some association with sneakers. Right. And people say this all the time. Right. I can't I can't drive the same car that Jay-Z has, but I can wear the same Jordans. Right. And so you, there's a lot of those same through lines in sneakers of why they relate to so many different people. And that's what's going on in cars. And then on top of that is that generation right behind us where, yeah, like maybe they're not at the same point from economic kids, family. And but some of them do have money. Some of them do have influence, i.e. Logan Paul two weeks ago buying a $200,000 box of Pokemon, right? He is that generation 10 years younger. He's that generation 10 years behind for, for sports and Pokemon. But because he is that outlier that has influence, says what's cool, has money, right? And now all of a sudden, all the people that follow him. So that is catching up. It won't be a 10-year lag between Pokemon and gaming cards and sports. Like it's happening concurrently because of that. Because now you have everyone around it, the investors, the money, all the people that follow the people that create that stuff. So it's a, it's a, it is a real uh, and frankly, an obvious ecosystem that's happening. It's creating it and COVID's making that happen faster and quicker. And that's a really, really like good summary of, of why this thing's blowing up. It's funny because like, it seems like COVID almost had a very uh, impactful on the, the market and the industry. And I think, you know, Jason, again, I'll reference, he's like, he's my very good friend of mine. Also like, you know, genius card, guy been in the industry forever knows everything uh, about about it you know he was saying at the start of covid he was a little worried things were kind of it was like unsure what was going to happen but then the last dance comes out um other stuff start people that are kind of paused at home uh it seems like it ended up picking up and really pushing it uh, that not being specifically the last dance but definitely around the time and people maybe even got more interested in it uh what is uh what would be some of the risks though to people maybe you know haters or people like i look at like the kelly criterion you know that about having a certain percent of your bet on like whether it's bitcoin or alternative assets and you want to have a portfolio you want to have your whatever it is you know how would you say let's just let's just call it what it is how would you tell my wife 
you know, your wife, we had a joke about this a bit about you know, how you got to persuade her, you know, how I play poker for a living. So it's a little easier for me. I'm already yeah. kind of out there on the spectrum of uh, uh -huh. different, but like, and I tell my wife, no, 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 it's okay. Like, instead of putting this, we're going to buy, I'm going to buy a X amount of sports card. And she looks at me like I'm insane, you know? And, and like, yeah, I think your wife and others can relate. Where does that sort of, uh, how do you able to uh, justify that? How would you say someone like, well, I don't even know the good example. Let's just say someone right now is 10 grand. They want to invest right now and they got extra cash. Where would you compare, you know, the risk reward with sports cards and how would you sort of advise them and say like, look, like if you go this, you can find some blue chips, you can find some good cards. How would you, how would you say to someone out there who's thinking about investing? Why would they want to, you know, how would you risk, put that in the risk portfolio for them to buy cards? Yeah. Well, first of all, let's just be like, totally transparent because i think a lot of people miss this sports cards are still a market and they're going to go up and down and you know just because you know we think that there's a lot of opportunity and cards have been going up a lot over over the past you know two years you know in the last uh six weeks cards have actually gone down uh and some cards have gone down a decent amount from where they were six weeks ago now they're still up those same cards are still up considerably from where they were six months ago right right but you know, over the last two years, we've seen a very similar pattern of, you know, spike, drop a little dip, spike, drop a little dip. And um, and to understand that it's a it's a long game. So the, the starting point is understand that it is a long game. By the way, it doesn't mean that it's a 10, 20 year game, but we're at least talking about a couple of years here now where what you're doing is you're playing the, the gap in supply and demand between how many cards exist, which is actually relatively small compared to the millions of people that are coming into the hobby every day and will continue to do so over the next 18 to 36 months. All the reasons, all the things that you just said, all the things we just talked about, about why people are coming into the hobby led by our generation, that is happening. And look, sure, maybe there's a possibility that every one of those people wakes up tomorrow and says, eh, maybe I don't, maybe I'm not interested in cards, but probably not, right? We're, right. we're like, in my opinion we are past the point of no return on that now it's still a process as those people come in so you have millions of people coming in the actual cards that exist are relatively small most of these cards well i mean all of them printed before say two years ago were manufactured at a time when the demand for the for trading cards was very very small so you have a lot of these iconic cards so michael jordan's 1986 clear rookie right probably the most iconic card that we have in the highest grade in a PSA 10, there's only 315 of those that exist in the whole world. And that's all there ever will be. Maybe there's, you know, buy 10 more out there that'll, that'll show up over the, the coming years. But, but like, that's it. Like that is insane. Like how many people might want to own the best Jordan car, like millions. And by the way, even the next condition down a, a PSA nine, there's only about 27 or 2,800 of those. 2,800 is still, a, there's 2,800 Jordan fans like on my block. Like it is, it is so like comical, the, the gap between supply and demand. And that's what you're investing into. So can you put $10,000 to work anywhere else in the world right now where you have that disparity between how few, the scarcity of the asset that it, and then how many people might want to own it? Because that's what drives the value, right? That that gap in supply and demand. And so, you know, I think there's an opportunity for cards to be. I mean, I, honestly, like I can't even figure it out because cards have grown so much in the last year. But you know, anything that I'm buying today, I think if um, knowing that I'm buying things that are smart and buying things, you know, like Jordan and LeBron and Kobe and those iconic players, if they're not 10x in in three years then I feel like I will have seriously misjudged the market. I feel like they should all be like well over a 10 X in three years, just given we're looking now all sorts of disclaimers, you know, do not take financial advice from us and blah, blah, like, you know, I, I am, but you know, but like all we're looking at is just that gap in supply and demand and, and what happens to it um, when you have that, that scenario. And how would you compare it to like Bitcoin per se? Like, do you, what are you, what's your thoughts on crypto in general? Like, do you believe it's similar where the upside's just so much bigger than the downer in theory, Bitcoin could, go down a lot more. Whereas a Jordan nine, for example, is not going to, that card really shouldn't lose much value. Right. I mean, that's like pretty hard. It's different in a way, but it's like, yeah, I mean, look it, it, in full transparency, like I don't invest in crypto. Um, and I, I certainly wouldn't consider myself anywhere near an expert, but 
like note the one major like difference there is that um you know a jordan rookie is based on it's michael jordan and his the the demand side of the equation of why people want that card like that story's been written like any way you cut it jordan's the best basketball player of all time and um and you know that that card represents so much more you know we started this conversation on a question in terms of lack of utility right but i would say there's more utility in that than than uh than bitcoin because at least in that i'm tapping into nostalgia or jordan as a fan or, or all the stuff around him as opposed to bitcoin being just purely you know, an instrument of currency so right. Um, yeah. okay. Well, I know we, we, I, there is a zillion, literally, I think you set the record. We got a nice fat giveaway on, on Twitter. I just going to have to cut me off, man. Josh, you're one of those guys. I'm not going to quit. So I, you got to tell me when you got your, it's schedule. all good. I, I got, I got, I got to bounce in, uh, in, in two minutes here. Okay. Um, we, so we'll, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll take a few questions and then just tell me when one more, I mean, we'll, we'll yeah. again on Twitter guys, you are eligible for that $111 giveaway times four. So 444 dollar giveaway i will actually load one up and we can just pick a winner so we can at least get that in before you have to go and then maybe you know again josh josh has twitter you guys can follow him at josh luber here on twitter on instagram and of course StockX. he is the was a ceo he was also the one of the co-founders along with dan gilbert and several others um you know we covered a lot hopefully you know it could be a repeat guest too we got more i feel like there's so many more questions so many other things in the sports card so much in its infancy that hopefully we will be able to uh to cover some more in the future. Is there anything else you want to touch on? I mean, again, the questions are there. If you see any, maybe you can go through uh, at some point and answer a couple. If you see any that really yeah. told you that might be a better way to use our time than, than reading them and going through them. Uh, you know, I know you are extremely busy uh, and I do appreciate No, that'd be fun. I, I, I saw some interesting questions there, but, but why don't you choose the one that you think is, is good for, for the, uh, I don't know how you, how you choose the winners, but. Okay. Well, some of these have, well, I'm just going to do a random giveaway mm -hmm. for the, the winner but in terms of uh uh the questions i saw actually a lot that i um that i've already answered but uh let's just take one question um uh, what are some of the benefits you have realized by basing the company in detroit i guess just like give a detroit a little love what are some of the things you maybe didn't think of it at the time that now being here has become uh a, a, a positive for you yeah, I mean, honestly, more than anything, um, you know, I, 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 well, I already talked about, you know, sort of leveraging, you know, Dan and his network of everything, but um, it's been phenomenal from a PR standpoint, right? It's it particularly when you're when you're starting to break through, to be a, a big fish in a small pond is it, just way easier to get traction and get people, um, you know, attention. And you know, in the beginning, um, you know, every bit of that is, is uh, helpful. So it really was, you know, a, a massive positive there. And, um, and now we have to help carry some of that, but yeah, that's a big part of it. Awesome. Okay. Well, listen again, there's so many questions we did cover actually a lot. Cause a lot of similar questions. I'm just going to pick a $111 ticket winner right now. You tell me when we're going to roll it and then I'll let you roll out of here and hopefully we'll have a, a part two down the road sometime. So let's, uh, yeah, I when. think what, when, uh, you know, the, the trading card companies that we're working on are still on stealth mode, but maybe when uh, we start talking about them publicly and launch them. We can come back on and talk about the actual businesses too. So. Yeah. Maybe we'll do a joint with you and Jason. I know he's been, he yep. was a, um, not to be the hundredth guest for his part too. I said, Jason, you know, you'll we'll get you back on. So maybe we'll do a, a, a collaboration one down here in a couple of months, but go ahead. Just tell me when I'm going to pick up one of the four winners right now. All right. And stop. All right. We're loading it right here. Someone's getting this $111 ticket courtesy of party poker. We appreciate Josh. We appreciate his time. I will go ahead and, uh, well, a lot of, this is a set of record. I think a lot of engagement, a lot of interest. And I hope you guys got to learn about Josh, about StockX, about the, the sports card industry. And then again, we'll, uh, we'll, hopefully he can answer a few questions if he sees on there that, that jump out of him, but here we go. We got a winner right here. And uh, my man right there, Vince Wu, is going to have a $111 ticket. So congrats to him. Awesome. Josh, congrats. And, and we'll see you. We'll see you on. Uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get to play some poker again. And oh, yeah. that we'll, we'll link up and, uh, and and we'll definitely talk. And again, we can hopefully disclose more and show some other projects. I think we're aligned on a lot of similar interests and goals. So I uh, appreciate it. And I think uh, we should I think we should start a side business selling Bubblicious again. I would. Is that company around? I got to know. <laughs> I haven't seen it in a while, but that, that thing, I jumped out of my chair. I promise you like, literally, that's crazy. The fact that you mentioned a dollar a pack, a quarter a piece. That was what I would like. That's my thing. I tell people all the time. That was, I remember. Yeah. Like, and it was, it in was a, such, it was such easy math and, you know, selling gum in, in sixth grade. It was a, it was a good business. So, yeah. Hey man, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, this was a blast. It was awesome to be able to do this with you live. So I, I appreciate it.
Yeah, man. Thank you guys. All right. Well, Josh, thank you. And again, you can follow him on, on Twitter, on Instagram, and of course, StockX as well. You can check that out. That was a company that he has uh, co-founded and was CEO of, and, and it's obviously a billion dollar business and uh, follow your dream, do what you love and things, good things will happen. So we'll see you for number hundred with Bob Menery tomorrow, 2 PM. And uh, thank you so much again to Josh and, and give him a follow guys. He's a great guy and, and knows his stuff. Thanks. Bye. Bye.